I forgot to do that part. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, let's see here. All right, so can everyone see that? Yeah. Awesome, so there we go. So yeah, this is uh, the company that I started specifically for photography. Um, I initially started because of things like this sign. Um, I saw a lot of posts like this on Facebook. If a uh, bee disappears from the surface of the earth, man would have no more than four years to live. So I saw stuff like this and posted everywhere and I like, genuinely believed it. Um, so I started taking pictures of honeybees like this one. I wanted to display them in a beautiful light so people would see them as something that wasn't scary. Um, so I did this for maybe about three or four years, uh, visiting a bunch of different um, places that hosted bees, a lot of different apiaries. And then I took this photo and I was like, what is that? That's, that's a bee, but it's obviously not a honeybee. And this kind of led to like this whole, um, just basically led me down a rabbit hole where I was like, oh my gosh, there's other bees than just honeybees. Um, so I wanted to take photos of these guys because I found out there's about 4,000 of them in the US and that these bees, not honeybees, are actually the ones that are threatened and endangered. So I wanted to create beautiful photography of these guys, but I spent about a year like chasing after them and I couldn't figure out where they were and also couldn't figure out why I wasn't finding them. Um, so I saw a Facebook post online for the Crescent Farm at the LA Arboretum and they had all these native bees. So the first day I went there, I saw these bees. Um, uh, there's a couple more I saw as well, but I took these photos and I was like, why are there so many different bees here? Um, and basically the, the garden told me that they were planting native plants. And that's when I sort of figured out there's a connection between native plants and native bees. So one of the things that people promote with saving bees is actually saving the plants. Um, so this is some Boodalua grass that I found a lot of bees sleeping on. Uh, these are some different species of bees. Um, so one thing I wanna do is take really clear photos of these bees for identification, because right now um, what people are doing to actually identifying bees is kill them, which I think is kind of counterintuitive. If you want to save the bees, kill them, it doesn't really make sense to me. So I was thinking through photography, maybe we can find a way to get better, clearer photos of them and keep them alive in the process. So that's what I started doing. Um, these are some bees that were on the Boodalua grass, just to show you a couple of different species. I think they're really cool. Um, also started going to the Mojave Desert. This is a really cool plant. It's a um, buckwheat that's uh, unique to that area. And these are two bees that I found on the plant. They're actually the same species. Uh, the upper left-hand corner is a female. The lower right-hand corner is a male. It's a duck-faced bee, I think. Um, but one thing I noticed about these guys is the coloring really matches this plant. And I was like, that's really interesting. And it kind of led me to understand that a lot of creatures evolve together to have a symbiotic relationship. And it applies to things other than just bees and insects. Um, like koalas, for example. This kind of led me to understand more about them. Like with uh, the fires in Australia last year, um, a lot of the koalas that didn't perish in the fire, they actually started starving to death because they only survived from one plant, which was eucalyptus leaves. So bees are the same way. So if um, there's just this one specific plant dies, this bee has a symbiotic relationship with it, meaning this bee could also perish. So if uh, the specific plant disappears, so does that bee. And honeybees don't have that relationship, which is why when people say save the bees and show a picture of a honeybee, uh, that doesn't really make sense because it's kind of like saying save an endangered species, but then the first species you talk about saving is a dairy cow. So uh, hopefully that makes sense for people. But um, also I wanted to point out some other little critters, critters that I saw on this plant too, how their coloring kind of matches up with the plant. Um, crab spider as well. And also I started to find out if I wanted to look for other bee species, look for other plants. Um, so the next bee that I started looking for was the smallest bee in the world. In the upper left-hand corner here, this is a Perdita minima. It's a little under two millimeters. And if you look at the quarter, um, there's a flower that's actually 
the same flower that this bee is on. So that'll give you a reference to the size. And while I was there, I also found another bee, which is in the upper right-hand corner. Um, this bee actually hasn't been identified besides the genus. Um, so then started looking at other bees by the flowers that they sleep in. Um, this one is a diadisa bee in a globe mallow flower. Um, so these two creatures evolve together. This flower actually closes up every single night and a bee will crawl into the flower and kind of tuck itself in like a bed. Uh, so this is in the morning where the flower is starting to open up and the bee is peeking out. Um, here's a picture of another diadisa, different species. Um, this one lives in the ground. That's another thing. Uh, I started taking pictures of bees in the ground because I noticed that 70% of native bees actually are ground nesting. So you want to save the bees, you save the plants, but you also preserve a lot of bare ground too. So there's another bee that lives in the ground outside of its burrow. Um, again, I just wanted to show that these bees are beautiful. So there's a lot of variety that aren't just honeybees. So yeah. That's everything. <laughs> wow. Uh, can you show us some of the, um, um, I'll give the class a, a chance to, um, to uh, ask some questions. Sure. So go ahead and unmute your mic. I know um, one of the biggest questions I had uh, was what kind of equipment are you using uh, mm -hmm. to get this close up? Does anybody else have that same kind of question? Uh, well, the uh, equipment I'm using, I started out for about four years. I was just taking pictures with my cell phone um, because camera equipment is really expensive. So I was like, if I stick with this for a while, then I'll get an actual camera. Um, so right now I shoot with a Nikon D500, which is a great lens for macro photography because it's a, or it's a great camera body for macro photography because it's a crop sensor. And I shoot with a 105 uh, Nikkor millimeter um, f2.8 and I also put diopters on the front so diopters are like magnifying glasses to get you even closer and then um, I also have two speed lights on the side so everything's lit up really well which like this photo for example okay so you have a speed light uh, going I can see the light on the wing mm -hmm. I, I could see that yeah beautiful yeah beautiful I think is there a question in the chat Let's see, where do you go to find these bees? Um, so the easiest way to find these bees is look for native plants that they have that symbiotic relationship with. Um, buckwheat is a big one. It's a big uh, genus of family of plants. Um, if you go to different kinds of buckwheat, you can find specific kinds of bees. For example, um, so this is a Prudita nisuta and it only pollinates this plant. So if you look for this plant, there's a good chance in maybe around June, July, you'll also find that bee. Um, so in LA, the LA Arboretum is great. They have the Crescent Farm, which is completely native plants. So if you go there, you'll find a bunch of species of bees. Uh, so far, I've photographed about 35 there. Wow, wow. Um, and um, any other questions from the group? I have another question and that is, what is your process? Like, how do you get up at, like what the, the bee that is sleeping and waking up, what okay. morning was that? And what's your process? Yeah, so um, the easiest way to photograph bees is when they're not moving. So when they're sleeping, I've noticed bees will start to kind of um, especially these are male bees, by the way. So it's really easy to photograph male bees starting between like 6 p.m. to maybe 8 a.m. because they're just not moving. A lot of them will clamp onto grasses like this Buddha Lua. And um, since they're not moving, you could just like go up there and take a bunch of pictures of them. Otherwise, if you want to take pictures of them while they're awake and flying around like these guys, you just have to have a lot of patience I was out there for hours just trying to take good pictures. So you can take hundreds of pictures and then only a few turn out really well. So it seems like your process is first knowing the plants that the bees will, will or lo knowing the plants where the bees will be either living or, or sleeping or pollinating. And, mm -hmm. and um, so do you set up your camera on a tripod with your lights? Um, what does that look like? 
Um, I actually don't use a tripod. Um, I shoot everything handheld. Um, so yeah, it's basically chasing the bees around. Um, but I guess like another thing to know is if you know when flowers are in bloom, the life cycles of bees also line up with those flowers. So if you notice like, um, I guess the sunflowers, when you notice when the sunflowers start to bloom, a certain bee will, species, they're, they'll start to come out of the ground, they'll start to become adults then. And when those flowers die out, that also means that bee is dying out as well. Wow. Wow. So what is the, from your study, from this study, what is the life cycle of, of a bee? Of, 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 and I'm, they probably have, each of them have a different type. Yeah, yeah it's, it's kind of subjective, really. Um, so bees can have multiple generations in a year. Some of them I've seen have three. Uh, some bees will only be adults for about two weeks. Um, and like right now, there's some bees that are still like mating and then they'll put their uh, eggs in the ground and their, their babies won't be born until early next year. But if like, let's say it's the end of spring, some of those bees could lay eggs and then because of the weather, their babies could be born maybe like a month or so later. So it really just depends on the bee. Wow, wow. Um, another question I have is, um, what did you study in high school? Like. When you were in high school, did you think you would be doing this? I did not at all. Um, I, well, I kind of, I thought I was going to be a veterinarian. Um, I actually applied to a bunch of schools to be, to be that. I got in and then I uh, basically worked at a veterinary clinic for a couple of months and I realized I did not want to do it. So then I got into marketing. Um, ended up working in an office for quite a few years and then I started drawing. Um, and I basically took two years off from working, so I didn't work at all. And then I just did nothing but draw and that kind of blew up for me. And, um, drawing sort of led to photography because I wanted to take, um, original pictures. I didn't have any copyright. So I, I got a cheap camera, a really cheap camera and just started going out and taking pictures and then drawing off of that. Um, and that kind of developed my love for photography. Uh, so yeah. Can you show us some of your drawings? Sure. Uh, let's see here. Actually open this up. So this is my website. Um, so yeah, these are a lot of the pieces that I've done. Um, I started doing um, ballpoint in <laughs> artwork. We don't see that yet, so. Oh, it's not showing up? No. Um, hmm. I wonder, I see, I still see your slideshow. Oh, really? Okay. Maybe I need to change screen sharing. Oh, here we go. There okay, we is that better? Yes. Cool. All right. Um, so yeah, these are some of my pieces. Uh, they're ballpoint pen. Um, so I started doing pieces on movements more so recently. Uh, I think the only one I have up is this Black Lives Matter one. This is my friend, uh, Shamel. I actually did a TED talk with her about two years ago and she's really into uh, dance activism. So I thought she'd be a great subject for this piece. And then uh, I love Black Panther. So I did a ballpoint drawing of that and uh, Chadwick Boseman actually shared that on his social media, which was really cool. Um, this is a obviously acrylic piece. I also do some pieces in sugar. Um, so this is just sugar laid out on a blackboard of a wait, bee that I, wait, shut, wait, talk of me, talk me through this. Oh God. Um, so yeah, basically it's just uh, I lay sugar on a black canvas and just kind of arrange it in the shape of whatever I like. So this one's a B. Um, so yeah, it's just basically like a monochromatic piece. Um, this is the first one I did, lion hair. Uh, this is an elephant. Wait, make them bigger. I want to see these. So what led you to the sugar art? Um, I was actually, I saw a guy on the beach doing sort of something similar with sand. And I was like, oh, I could do that at home. Um, but then I didn't want to buy a bunch of sand 
and like ruin my apartment. So <laughs> I ended up just getting some sugar and like doing this on my coffee table. And uh, this was the first one I did and it turned out pretty well. So I was like, oh, I'll keep doing this. And it's 20 by 30. It's That's not a small piece. Um, that's the original one. Yeah, I think the original was also 20 by 30, but yeah, I sell, sell it in 20 by 30 as well. Um, yeah, and then an elephant face. Um, so yeah, a couple different things. One of my favorite K-pop stars that's in pen, um, a motorcycle, that's sugar. I do some Photoshop as well, just some like kind of funny things. So yeah. So you've got quite a variety of different uh, ways of expressing yourself and different ways of exploring um, the world around you. What's mm -hmm. your favorite medium so far? Um, I think photography, honestly, uh, just because it takes me outside. And I feel like there's just so much to learn about nature. Um, I'm just really learning a lot about biodiversity and how it's, it's really kind of cool seeing the circle of life. Like people always talk about like circle of life and like Lion King, you know, we sing it, but then like, we don't really apply it to the real world. We see things that kill other things in nature as maybe bad, but we don't necessarily see them as balancing each other out to maintain life long-term. So I think photographing bees has kind of led to that because there's bees who attack other bees and we think, oh, those are bad bees, but actually they're doing their job of keeping the population in control. So something doesn't happen that's bad to the ecosystem overall. So I just, I really think taking pictures outside, just being in nature has really taught me a lot. Hmm. Sienna has a question. Sienna, go for it. Um, yeah, um, I just, I'm wondering like if you have any ways that you record your progress, like a journal or something, or is it on your website or anything? Um, like my progress for photography or what do you mean? Yeah, like in, our class, we had like journals that we had to do. I'm wondering. If you oh yeah, them. actually I do. Um, I have an Excel sheet of every single location I've ever been to with my bees uh, to photograph the bees. And I have I, what species I saw, male, female, what time of the year, what plant they were on, any sort of notes uh, when they were sleeping, um, just things like that. But then also with my uh, photography too, on my Instagram page, it just kind of gets better. So if you scroll down, like the quality of the photos get worse. So that's a way that other people can see my progress. <laughs> Cool. So you do keep a, an extensive um, yeah. journal of uh, how uh, uh, things are going and um, what you might want to, uh, because I know when we talked just recently, you were telling me that you have aspirations of taking even more bees and mm -hmm. investigating more of, uh, of California um, and looking for bees that are, are specific to different locations. Yeah, so I um, I think it was July of this year, I photographed my first endangered species. Um, I don't know if I could pull this up in the screen capture since it seems to change, but it's a, it's an endangered bumblebee. And I actually uh, got in contact with a photographer from National Geographic because of that. And we're going to go hunting for other um, bees next year that are also endangered or threatened because it's actually kind of hard to get these creatures on the endangered species list. Like you have to put a application in, um, list what their population counts is. It's just a lot of different things. It's really technical and it's kind of hard to figure out what their populations actually are. Um, so we're hoping to find a lot of these bees that are maybe that we think are endangered or like have been you know, unspotted for years because we found that a lot of people just aren't actually looking for them. So we're hoping that maybe they're out there somewhere. Um, people just haven't seen them. Cool. Um, so um, it seems to me that um, you are uh, between uh, a fine line between documentary, documenting scientific discoveries and also art. Um, yeah. Tell a little bit about that line for me. Um, it's, it's a really blurry line 
I feel like it overlaps a lot. Um, so a lot of people in my position who didn't actually study this in school uh, were called citizen scientists. So I don't, I actually like what I do specifically, I'm not sure if there is a line. I feel like they just kind of overlap because I do have a background in art, but then I also love photography. So I feel like they kind of blend together. And I think that's a great sort of mixture when there's a lot of people who aren't really interested, but they see these, these insects portrayed in a really beautiful way. So hopefully that kind of draws their interest. Got it, got it, excellent, excellent. So um, I'm going to uh, kind of turn it over to the rest of the class and ask you all to uh, continue the dialogue uh, with uh, Crystal um, and ask some questions, please. George, Katie, Casey, Chloe. I'm looking at the chat. So if you have a question that you want me to tell, uh, to ask. Trev, you have a question? Trev, you should have a question because you are also grappling with this idea of drawing and, um, okay, Casey, have you ever been stung by a bee? I was stung one time by a honeybee, um, but I also, I was in a hive, but hive was open and I stuck my hand in the hive, which, you know, I do a lot for pictures. I used to do a lot for honeybees and one stung me on the thumb. Uh, that's the only time I've ever been stung. Cool, cool. So Trev, do you have a question? Uh, because um, she's doing some uh, artwork, not only photography, which is why I wanted uh, Crystal to kind of show up because when I saw her artwork, I'm like, whoa, what an unusual um, medium to use sugar. <laughs> um, yeah, I've seen, I've seen like a lot of different uh, mediums used. Like there's um, people who use the sugar and salt who have always like, have appreciated that because it's kind of insane how one slight mess up, or it, it's also insane how you guys compose your pieces using you know, a grain of salt or sugar that's extremely different from putting pen to paper. Um, I guess my question, because I'm trying to branch out from just sketching, uh, I recently started like painting again. My question is, what is your thought process behind experiencing with new um, ways to convey your artwork? Because I'm not much of a photographer. Oh. Um, um, honestly, when something just pops in your head, just go for it. That's what I did with sugar. Um, as far as I'm aware, I'm the first person who started working with sugar online. I've seen other people doing like uh, salt and like mandalas, things like that. But yeah, if you have an idea, honestly, just go for it because you might create something really amazing. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, I think that's a good, good, uh, good suggestion and good way to think about it is you 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 can't mess up if you don't try and you want to mess up yeah honestly yeah like nothing wrong with messing up <laughs> how many times did it take you to perfect your sugar art um apparently i did it pretty well the first time um <laughs> that was that lion piece that i, I showed you before um how, yeah, I don't know. It just turned out really well. How long did it take you to do that one piece? If you were um, that one, not that long. I want to say maybe like three hours. It's a long time. Oh, okay. Well, I don't know. My ballpoint pen pieces take between like 40 and 60 hours. So like three hours, I think is pretty short. Wow. So your ballpoint pieces, your ballpoint pieces, um, are you uh, deriving them from what you're seeing from memory from how we, how are those how do those come about so i always look at something um let me just go back to that so i always have a reference photo um that i use because they get really really detailed if it's just like an eye or some lips or something where i'm just sketching out an idea like i don't need to look at anything but these i always use reference photos Okay. And then um, for your reference photos, um, are you um, work like, so for the one with um, Lupito, Lupito mm -hmm. 
it's got color in it as well. What other, what, what else did you use? And are you putting the earrings together or is this all from reference? This is all from reference. Um, the entire thing's ballpoint pen. So the color is ballpoint pen. Um, the sea turtle here is completely ballpoint pen as well. Um, so I use a lot of like colors too. Um, I like the way black looks with people just cause I think it looks richer, but yeah, that's, that's an example of color ballpoint pen ballpoint pen just the big c is what you said yeah so i use big um amazon has their own brand too because they have a lot of colors uh yeah just regular ballpoint pens um how did you begin that journey of using ballpoint pen to because i know there's another there's an artist and i can't remember his name he's uh, uh african i met him years ago he's from benin he also uses ballpoint pen oh. and he story is that that's all he had when he was in Africa with a ballpoint pen. Um, and so he does really intricate. I mean, if it takes you 40 hours to do one piece, he, I would say it would take him sometimes days because then he would have to wait for the shipment of new ballpoint pens to come in. And that's how we met, which he would ask uh, people to send him ballpoint pens. Um, so oh, yeah. Um, I actually started the same way because I, I don't know who has a pencil anymore. So I had a pen. So I just drew with a pen because that's what I had. And then I stuck with it. Wow. Yeah. So make a mistake or an error or like, do you move on or do you cover it up? Or how do you how do you work with that? Uh, well, yeah, I make mistakes throughout the entire thing. Like I still see them when I look at them. Other people don't seem to notice them, but they're just so small because I draw so slowly that um, it's not really noticeable huh. in the big picture. Yeah. So the, for the acrylic that you set up with the two wine glasses against the wall, the one in the middle there, but yeah. Talk to me about that one. So this was kind of a unique experience. Um, I was actually working with a company, um, to get my artwork in their stores. And basically I had the color scheme that they wanted and I created, this is based on a wave. I don't know if that's like obvious or not, but uh, yeah, I put the, I created a design that I felt would match their showroom and that's what I created. Awesome. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Thanks. All right. Well, we are almost out of time and I really wanted to thank you uh, for coming today and sharing your work and hopefully inspiring my students to know that even with a ballpoint pen, some sugar and some ideas and imagination, you too can uh, do the incredible work that you've been doing. Um, I mean, I, I'm in awe of the sugar art. I'm just gonna, oh, I'm just gonna say. Um, and I'm also in awe of your um, drawings and the meticulous uh, manner in which you <laughs> Um, I mean, all of this is very meticulous. Everything you do is meticulous. And that is um, part of the process is knowing that all these little details make up uh, your sugar art, make up your drawings and even your photography that that really fine attention to detail is all about your process. And I think, um, I think we, we are moving so fast uh, that I appreciate you slowing down enough to make this beautiful art for all of us to appreciate. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Cool. So let's give a round of applause, everybody. I don't hear anybody out there. Unmute your mic. And um, um, Crystal, if you would unshare your screen so we can kind of see everybody, um, make sure everybody's here. So unmute your mics, people, and let's give a round of applause today. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you, Crystal. That's, that's some good stuff. I don't know about y'all, but like, um, I, uh, I gave up um, painting for photography, so. Oh, uh, you can do both, yeah. So let me, let me, let me see.